First thing we're going to do is just announce the winner of the test well competition. So how much water in the well? Now, unbelievably, Listen to this. we've actually got a dead heat. We've got two people who have put exactly the same answer down, and they're the two that are closest to it. Now, the correct answer, you didn't by any chance put these in order. Paul, yes. you didn't by any chance put these in order, so I can embarrass you first because I'm the bottom with the worst <laughs> guess, can I? <laughs> right, but the correct answer was 78,050 litres. 78,050, 78050 litres. Uh, for those of you that are a little bit older, 17,171 gallons. John Biggs, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> John, what did you guess, mate? Um, 18,000, I, I think you guessed 400,000. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, Ben Kemp. Where's Ben? <laughs> he just left. Ben's just gone, has he? When you see him, tell him that he managed to add 25% to the previous guess. <laughs> oh, come on, have we got any that are bigger than that? Two people that won. Firstly, Richard Carrington. Yeah. Joined us today, Richard, if you'd like to come up and get a bottle of champagne signed by Chris Powell. Uh, yeah. Sorry, my yeah. apologies. Congratulations. Well done. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Camera's there, Richard. Camera's there. <laughs> oh, sorry, <yeah. laughs> it's a video camera, Richard. <laughs> 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 Yeah, okay, that's fine. No, no, seriously, sit down, please. <laughs> okay. Now! Uh, Gemma, can we have you up here again, please? Uh, second person who's put 80,000 litres on their card is Gemma Gibbons! <laughs> Gemma, what was, your, what was your first guess? A lot. It was a lot. I haven't <laughs> tried it. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. We thought we'd finish the day off um, with uh, something a little bit informative. What we wanted to do, obviously you're all our special guests today. So we thought we would select two of the special guests at random and find out a little bit more about what you do for a living and get a little bit of an insight into what your day-to-day -day activities are. So we've done a little bit of a draw, and the couple of names that come out of the hat are Gemma Gibbons and Chris Powell. So where are Gemma and Chris? Would you like to come over to the <laughs> okay, now, um, when we looked at how we, how we would set out today, um, with, with Chris and Gemma joining us today, which we thought was fantastic, um, thought probably there won't be very many occasions when each of you are in a room with an Olympic silver medalist um, and a, a very successful championship football manager. No, it's not just that. That's a game, isn't it? Championship football. <laughs> a football yeah. manager of a championship yeah. team. A lot of people play it. And yeah. Out, well, yeah. Well, I should be doing it. <coughs> so, yeah, we'll come on to that in a minute. <laughs> funny enough. Um, what we thought we'd do is, is just spend sort of 20, 30 minutes. And uh, it, like I say, it's not often you get the opportunity to, to be with people who actually do something quite special with their lives and do something very different to, to what most of us do. Now, we, we've had a chat with Gemma and Chris, and both of them are saying, look, if, if you've got a role in field sales on air conditioning, I think rather air conditioning more than pumps, I'll give up the judo and the football and I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> but we haven't got any, any vacancies at the moment, so they're stuck with their current careers. So what I thought we'd do is, is just uh, a, a little bit of Q&A um, in terms of what sort of stuff you do. And I had to start really um, with when we were setting the day up and Paul said, look, I've been looking at what we want to do, and uh, there's a young lady who's won an Olympic silver medal. She's actually a Charlton girl, born and bred, lived in Charlton and Greenwich all your life, yeah? Um, I'd like to see if you can make contact with her and if we can get her along for, for the Open Day. This was about three or four weeks ago. So I thought, okay, well, where'd you start? Where'd you start trying to track down somebody like that? So I got onto the internet, as you do, and uh, found this lovely thing called Twitter, all right, which is excellent. 
Um, it's the first website I've visited where a 50-year-old man can randomly approach 25-year-old girls in the police <laughs> 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 What, what I was also surprised about as well was how much information you can find out about someone if they're an avid Twitterer. Yeah, I do. Is that right? Twitter. 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 Oh, I am so sorry. I didn't realize there's so many experts in the room. So, I've done a bit of research, okay? And it's amazing what you can find out as you... Okay. Yeah? That's Kelly's baby, all right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you worried yet? <laughs> yep, what do you mind me? It's a bit creepy though, isn't it, to be yeah. fair? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't know, we're all right, Chris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, uh, you, you do like your Twitter, don't you? You yeah, are in there quite yeah, a lot. I'm, I'm getting into it. You're now. getting into it, okay. Um, you've been posting quite a lot of pictures ever since your success at the Olympics, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, when, when did you actually win your silver medal? What was the date of the fight that you won? 2nd of August. 2nd of August, so we're in August, September. So you're coming up three months now. Yeah. Now, in the course of that, that three months since the Olympics, mm -hmm. you've got pictures on your account with some fairly shady characters, haven't you? Yeah, who, who a did you, few. Who did you meet in Rio de Janeiro? Um, David Cameron? Yes, yes, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. <laughs> um, you've got some good stuff, Professor Green. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. a good one. Yeah, for those of you that aren't aware, he's a rapper. <laughs> One person's music, okay, the type of stuff that 25 year old ladies would be into. Uh, Davina McCall, you did some charity work. Oh, she's really nice. Yeah, yeah. two million pound drop. Yeah, we didn't lose all the money either, so that was good. I didn't see the end of that because it was a bit late for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, how much did you win? Um, as a team, we won 200,000 for charity. 200,000? Yeah. So not mm. bad. What stage did you come into it? Because I did watch it up to about halfway through. Question that was five. Past. Question five. Yeah. Can you remember what your question was? Yeah, it was pretty easy. What was it? Um, it was, so Brad Pitt this week is the first man to do what? And the answers were to give birth to George Clooney's love child, <laughs> to play the part of Money Penny in the new Bond film, or to be the face of the new Chanel number no. five advert, perfume advert. I can definitely dismiss one of those. Yeah, that the guy I was with wanted to put the money on that one. Really? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Who were you with? Uh, my teammate, Ashley McKenzie. Ed, he's also a judo person. Yeah, he's a judo player. I think he's been okay. thrown on his head a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, we did mention this earlier when we were talking. Uh, you've got a couple of pictures on your portfolio that aren't of people, haven't you? They're of locations. Yeah. Yeah, we're all <laughs> kind of thinking like hotel in London, posh one. Oh yeah, we went to. The Don't read, you oh, were there. Yeah. <laughs> went to research this, you lived it. Uh, yeah, we went to the Corinthian Hotel the other day, and I, c I couldn't even find my hotel room because it was snuck behind another door and another door and another door. Really. It was very very posh, and went into rooms. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, what, champagne. Yeah. Went through to the bathroom. It was like ten times the size of my bathroom at home. I'm, I can't even call it a jacuzzi, it was ridiculously big, yeah. with TV stuck on the wall, two separate showers, yeah. two I'm toilets, two toilets, two toilets. <laughs> in the same room, yeah, with no it, door in it between. Was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took a picture and tweeted you took that. A pic in, in those circumstances, what's the only thing you can do is take a picture of the bath and post it and online. It, yeah. it? Excellent. And where were you the day before yesterday, Gemma? At Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace. And what did you go to Buckingham Palace for? take a picture of the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a side issue. I thought you'd actually gone to meet the Queen. Yeah, no, I went to, <laughs> went to meet the Queen. It was a um, Olympic medalist reception at Buckingham Palace. So all the medalists went down and had a nice little function down there. Excellent. And did you have to get, get any time to chat with the Queen? Yes, very, very, just a little bit. Yeah. Um, she said, oh, what do you do? I said, judo. And that was it, she was pretty much off. <laughs> <laughs> She'd been talking to the horse riding guy, so I don't think she was too bothered about talking oh, about what you guys. Shame but... you could have asked her about a skydive. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, did you say it was the 2nd of August you won your medal? Yeah. Right, how many Twitter followers did you have on the 1st of August? About 400. How many have you got now? <laughs> 29,000. 29,000 people hanging on your every word. Who's the most famous person following you? Oh, I don't know. Have you looked? I've got a list. Okay. So. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. No, I'm joking. I wasn't going to scroll down 29,000 people. Yeah, I don't know because you don't get notifications for all of them. Don't you? There's quite a few. So. Well, you, got, you don't think it says following? Just tick on that and just keep going down. 29,000? Yeah. 
<laughs> Famous faces will obviously uh, push themselves out. But you, seriously, you've had a massive change to your life, haven't you? Yeah. You couldn't, I imagine, or I can't imagine that you can have imagined how much it would have changed on the basis of what you achieved at the Olympics. Yeah, it still doesn't seem quite real now. Um, judo is not a massive sport in Britain. Um, and yeah, so ne never really had much media attention before. And then, yeah, the, the day I won that medal, everything's changed. Do you like it? Yeah, I like it. I'm, I'm quite looking forward to going back to normality as well, to be honest. Cause, right. Um, it's nice to just have your set, getting up your training, going to training, yeah. coming home, just doing normal stuff. But this is all amazing, and I'm so thankful that I'm getting to experience it all. You've done some like seriously glamorous stuff, haven't you, over the course of the last two and a half months, and some of the stuff that literally most 25-year-olds would give their left arm to do. Mm. But what got you there was your ability at judo. Now, I know you've, you've got your injury as well, because you had a, an operation on your hand, didn't you? Mm. Um, and you were saying earlier that it's going to be another couple of weeks before you can actually start uh, or get back on the mat, was how you described yeah, yeah. it, wasn't it? I've been it? training in I the gym, that's a judo but expression. Can't, get, can't do judo again for another two weeks. Okay. So how hard do you think you're going to find it to focus on that? Because obviously there's going to be an element where perhaps the media attention drops off a little bit straight after the Olympics, but it's probably something that's always going to be there for you. So how are you going to stay focused on what got you there in the first place? I think it will be quite easy because there's a lot, a lot of titles out there that I haven't won. I've never been world champion, I've never been European champion, and I'm still not Olympic champion. So there's a lot still out there that I want. Okay, so how did you get involved in judo first originally? Um, I was six and my mum took me along because her friend's kids went to the local club. Yeah. And yeah, started when I was six and yeah, couldn't, couldn't leave it. I've been doing it ever <coughs> since, so 19 years. And I read somewhere that you had to make a choice between Charlton Football Club <laughs> and judo, is that right? Or is that... Yeah, I, I, I quite, was quite into football when I was younger. Right. And I went along to the ladies under 16s um, Charlton training, training ground. What, six years old? No! Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was about 12 and um, I would never have made it, looking back now, but really? at the time I thought I was quite good. Okay. Um, went along, had, a, had ch joined in with the other girls, had a good <coughs> session and they were like, oh yeah, you're, you're allowed to join the group basically. Oh, right, I, I wasn't okay. that bad that I wasn't allowed to join the group, so they, they said I could join. Mum said, yeah, that's fine but you're going to have to pick because the night's on the same night as judo. So it's going to have to either be football or judo. And yeah, I chose judo. So have you always had that sort of sporty, competitive element to Because there's not many girls that would say, oh, look, you know what, I, I, I chose not to play for Charlton Ladies or whatever football team it is because yeah. I wanted to do judo. Have you always had that sort of desire to succeed at sport? Yeah, definitely. I think even I'm quite a competitive person. Um, and yeah, when I was younger, I loved judo, I fell in love with judo, but m more I fell in love with winning and wanting to win and wanting to be the best. Yeah. And I've always thought that I could do that in judo, um, and I enjoy judo as well, so I think that's what, what swayed my decision. That helps. How did you get selected for the Games? Because that wasn't straightforward, no. was it? So it's a two-year qualification period, and if it's not home games, you have to qualify through the world, world ranking list. So um, it's normally top 14 for women, I think it's top 21 for men. But however, it was, was a home game, so that means that um, we could take someone in each weight category. So it's one person in each weight category, so there's seven girls' weights and seven boys' weights. And I usually fight in that under 70 kilogram category. So yeah, for the last two years before the games, I spent all my time going away, fighting in these world, um, world ranking events. And I was half, halfway through the two year period, I was ranked number one, but then I needed shoulder surgery. So I had shoulder surgery, which put me out for about six months. So then when I came back, by the time, the time that I'd been out, the girl who was number two was now number one. And I had that six months to, to try and get back to number one. And unfortunately, I just missed out. Uh, but we were very, very close, and we always have been. We've been rivals since we were 12, and it's always been her number one, me number one, we've always been overtaking each other. And the coaches know that and so they, we, had, we didn't really have anyone that was brilliant at the weight, weight above. So they said before the last qualification event, they said, right, whoever's not number one, we want you to fight a tournament, there's one tournament before selections, we want you to fight that at the weight category above. If you do something, maybe we can select you. I wasn't number one, so I wasn't selected. So two weeks later, I fought the British Open at 78s, uh, won that. So that got me selected, and then I had two months to prepare for the Olympics at the weight category above. 
So that was pretty tough then, really, isn't it? Because it, it was yeah. like eight kilos difference between yeah, the weight category you were at and what. Yeah, and I, so normally I sit about 69 kilos. So I didn't have to. It's very strange to sit under your weight as a judo player, but I did. So I didn't have to diet anyway. But I've actually had to put on weight to be able to fight in the weight group above. Which, when you're a woman, you don't you don't want to be big and. Yeah, so that that's pretty difficult. All the boys like I could put weight on straight away. Like, give give me a couple of days, and I would have put on a stone. And I'm like, it's a bit different for women. Um, but I managed to put on some weight, and yeah, since the game, I've managed to put on a bit more. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so fought the Olympics, weighing 73 kilos. So still, just under a stone lighter than most of the other girls. That's an enormous potentially that's an enormous advantage to your your your, your competitor, isn't it? It is and it isn't. They're obviously a lot heavier, so probably a lot stronger, but I, I was a lot faster. So I just had to make sure that I used what I was better at to my advantage. So I knew I wasn't going to beat them in the first couple of minutes because they're j just too strong. So I just had to try not to get thrown in the first couple of minutes. And where they got tired because they're a bit bigger and stronger, I was hoping that I would be able to keep, keep my fitness up and get them towards the end of the fights. And that's pretty much how the whole whole day went. And how many fights did you have before you went to uh, like the, the, the medal fight, which was for the bronze, wasn't it? How many did you have no, to no, get so to I that? Had, um, had my first round fight, then I had my second round fight, then I had the quarter final, and then the semi final, and the semi final was to get into the final. Right. So I won the semi final, so that mean I, meant I had a guaranteed silver or gold, and then my fifth fight was the final, which I lost, right. which left me with the silver. Which left me with a silver. <laughs> what a bother. <laughs> Having said that, when when you've got that fight, who did you beat? Sorry, who did you beat in the the bronze medal match? The semi final. In the semi final, yeah. Um, I beat Chimio from France, who was the current world champion. Which at that weight category. Yeah. Honestly, going into that, did you really believe that you would win? Deep down, did you really think you would? <laughs> yes. On paper, I wasn't supposed to win a fight. But you fought on a mat. <laughs> yes. Um, in my head, I knew I could do something, but realistically, and looking at statistics, I wasn't going to do anything. Um, I wanted to win my first fight. and Not I would have been happy with that, but I would have been devastated if I hadn't won a fight. Sure. And after I got past, past my first fight, I relaxed a little bit and then just took each fight as it came. And, yeah, it was weird because I just kept winning and I said to my coach, what the hell's happening? <laughs> like, how am I in the quarterfinal of the Olympics? The next fight, how am I in the semi-final? And then, yeah, ended up in the final. That's so. amazing. So when you won the silver medal, yeah, how is it, I've always thought, in, in if, you're not talk, if you're talking about a race where there's eight people racing and you get first, second, third, then there's, a, there's an order and a structure to it. Yeah. When you go into that fight, you know you're going to get a silver, but at that point you must be desperately thinking, I want to win this gold. Yeah, it's, so it's difficult how's the emotion situation afterwards when obviously had the moment of my life I've got a guaranteed Olympic medal. Judo hasn't had a medal for twelve years. I've never had a, an Olympic medal and yeah, so everyone around me was crying, my whole team, everyone was so happy for me for British judo. But I've still got to go out there and have another fight. And I think for the, for my opponent, she she's um ex world champion, she's won the Pan Am, she's she's done a lot, so <clears throat> For her, she was expecting to go and get go and get that gold. <coughs> so I think there was probably different mindsets, but I was quite good and I just said, right guys, look, I've still got another fight yet, let's leave the tears and that until after. And yeah, settled down and just and tried to get on with it and I, I wanted to win, but yeah. it just wasn't to be. Yeah. So coming away from the actual fight fighting, in, in terms of like being in the athletes village. Now, there's not many really worldwide that get, I know it was like 10,500 in there, but if you spread that out across the world, there ain't that many people that get that experience. What was it like? It was good. Was it? <laughs> yeah, we were in there for three weeks, had to do no cooking, no washing up, <laughs> um, they changed my sheets, they, yeah, they did everything. It was, it was really good and not just that, it was, it was a great experience. From, well, never going to have an experience like that again, even yeah. if I go to Rio, it's going to be very different. Mm. Um, Everything was catered for us for the Brits. We had our separate sort of dining area as well, which we weren't really supposed to have, and some foreigners did get in. But it, it was set out for the Brits. It was right near our accommodation. Um, yeah, it was. It was all. It was all done for us, which is what the home advantage is about. Although you're officially not allowed to do that. So, yeah. Um, 
no, yeah, it was just it was it was wicked walking into the dining hall and you're just seeing not just everyone from all these different countries, but got guys that are like nearly touching the ceiling. Um, obviously basketball players and then you've got tiny little guys that look like they're 12, the gymnasts and it's, it's just really strange and all these people are sat eating together and yeah, it's, it's quite incredible. Even though everyone in there obviously, they, by definition you've got to be pretty competitive to actually get in that village, Yeah. but is there like a sense of camaraderie that you are all part of something special and therefore you've got a shared experience in there or is it very much people stick with their own team, their own kind? I think everyone sticks to their own their own team, like GB sort of sat, stuck together and I think you do do that but at the same time it's not like, oh we're not talking to you, it's just we're all wearing the same tracksuit so we're probably all going to stick together but I think everyone sort of gave respect to everyone else because everyone knew how hard they'd had to work to get there so knew how hard everyone else had worked to get there. Right. Right, now we're not going to post this on YouTube so it's just amongst all the people here, right? Okay. <laughs> Tell me one bit of gossip from the Athletes' Village that you don't know whether it's true or not, <laughs> but you think it's a bloody good bit of gossip. <laughs> um, well, I was in the paper, so I don't know if it's a secret, but I think Usain Bolt had a party with some of the Swedish... <laughs> 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 that probably was true. You think it was? Probably, yeah. You haven't got any evidence? Phone no, numbers? Nothing. No evidence. No, okay. No. <laughs> okay. You mentioned earlier about um, you didn't want to put the weight on. In terms of like when you're training normally, what sort of diet do you stick to? What sort of stuff can you eat, can't you eat, or do you not have to be that careful because of how many calories you burn? Usually, I, well, yeah, still I don't need to be that careful, but even at 70 kilos, I had to be careful as in I needed to make sure I've got enough carbohydrates, proteins, all of that stuff in. But a lot of the judo guys have to actually diet all the time to make their weight category. Right. Um, so it's pretty hard for them. But my, my hardest diet in, came in when I when I was 78 because it was I was basically being force fed by my coaches and I had to go on a load of supplements, maxi muscle protein bars, protein shakes, creatine and none of that stuff tastes good. And, <laughs> and it's it's like more training. Right. So you finish your training and my coach is there with the bar, eat that, drink that. And after training, especially after circuits, you feel like you're gonna throw up anyway and then you're having to chug down this protein shake and yeah, so that was the hardest time I've had with food. Was it? Yeah. Do you think you'll stay at that weight category now, or are you going to go back to 70 kilos? I had no intentions of staying at the weight category, but I've been suggested quite forcefully that I should <laughs> stay. Um, so I'm going to give it a year at this weight category and see what happens. Um, I'm not planning to go any, any further than 2016, so if for four years I need to be a bit bigger, then I can deal with that to, to try and be the best that I can at judo, but after that. So do you think the next Olympics will be the end of your, your judo career then? Is that the aim? I think so. I'll be 29 then, and God. judo doesn't go for it. No, no. 29, <laughs> bloody hell. Oh, God. <laughs> in, the, in the last two years, in this two-year qualification period, I'm quite young for a judo player. I've had two two bits of major surgery. Right. So... Hopefully not, but by the end of 2016, God knows what, what yeah. shape I'm going to be in. And I think to go on for another four years, I just don't, I don't, think, I'll, don't think my body will hold up, to be honest. So what's your next big competition that you've got coming up? Um, we've got a World Championships in all, uh, September sorry, and a European Championships in April. Um, but my first competition back will be in January, the British Charles. Excellent. Thank you very much for today. Good luck Thanks with that. Thanks for having me, guys. Can I ask one question? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you're very quick. You told me that uh, judo is not a massive sport in, in mm. Great Britain. I'm from Holland, and there, it is a big sport. And I think it is because um, a lot of medals are won by Dutch uh, judo. I beat the Dutch girl, actually. I know. <laughs> 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 Do you think because you won this medal that it will uh, increase the uh, people? Uh, I hope so. Um, that's um, I won a medal myself, and um, one of the other girls, Karina, won a medal as well. So we, we had two Olympic medals, and we hadn't had one for 12 years. Mm -hmm. So fingers crossed. British judo can, can grow on what we've what we've been able to do and, and make British judo yeah a bit uh, make judo a big sport in Great Britain. So fingers crossed, four or eight years time, we might be in the same position as you guys. <laughs> Could you do us one favour? Yeah. I think there's a few people that probably haven't seen the medal yet. Oh no, of course. <laughs>
Shall I just pass it round? Is it in there? <laughs> Shall I just pass it round? <laughs> <laughs> As you do. Do you remember, well, Walt Brown's a few photographs from him taken. Yeah, yeah. But if we do that at the end, okay. yeah, that'd be all right? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Much appreciated. Chris. Yes. <laughs> You're not on Twitter, are you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> lots of footballers are now, aren't there? Yeah, sadly. Yeah. 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 Anyone caused you any problems? <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, we, we're, we're quite, uh, you know, social media is, is, has a big role in everyone's lives now. Uh, Twitter and Facebook, etc. And, you know, a lot of clubs do monitor they're players. We don't. Well, I don't. <laughs> um, but I'm, you know, I spoke to my players in the summer. You do have to remind them because it, it, it can be quite. Uh, it can be. You know, it's a good way to interact with the fans because they can't meet every fan. But the problem with it is, if um, if things don't go right for the team or that particular player, you know, be ready for what you might get. Yeah. You know, from people. So. What we, what we tend to do, I, I spoke to them last season, and then in this summer, I, I'm thinking that I may have to remind them again, is that just be careful what you put on there. Um, you know, if you're not brave enough to say it to someone's face, you shouldn't put it on there. Mm. So I tend to say to them, you know, always thank the fans after games, but don't get into, you know, this is no good, I've been dropped from the team. You know, that's something that should be kept mm. in house. So um, we've seen players recently get into to problems and it can create, I mean, Ashley Cole with regards to, you know, his reaction to what happened with him, you know, caused him a whole host of problems. And it's it's something that is out there, you can't do much about it, but just remind the players, they're young, um, they're inexperienced at times and um, they do need advice at times. and. You just ask them to be careful, you know, and not put on things that will harm themselves, their teammates, and especially the football club. Mm. It is a tough area, like you say. I mean, the FC Cole thing has been uh, um, out, and I thought that was the second time, wasn't it? I think that he's yeah. put something stupid on there. Yeah. Who the thought footballer makes the same mistake twice? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> More than twice, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this time last year, actually, mm. did you read this while I was talking to Gemma? No. Promise, because you, you have a chance of redeeming yourself for your well guess. Do you know what your uh, record was this time last year? This day uh, last year? How many did you play? I'll, I'll tell you you played 15. You played 15 yeah, games How many points did you have from, for, from 15 games? So, uh, we lost our first one after 13. It's going to be a while if you go through all 15, to be fair, Chris. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> to, I, I know when we lost our first one, which was after 13. Um, beat Carlisle, we won the next two. We would have had, um, I'll tell you what, we would have had quite a few points, 30 odd points? Yeah. Yeah, 34, 35. Good shout, 34 points, well done. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> and you were sat nicely at the top of League One. Of course, yeah. Did you come out of that position between then and the end of the year? Did you stay yeah. there? Um, after uh, we, we were top, Mid September, early September, I never came from there. And you broke all sorts of records last year in terms of goals and points and stuff mm. like that, didn't you? Yeah, marvellous year for us. A bit different this year. <laughs> well, that's funny. I'm just going to come on to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've played 18 so far this year, haven't you? Uh, no, not 18. <laughs> really? 18 games. Damn that BBC Sport website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I know what played, I've done. Yeah. only played 11. Played 11. How many points yeah. have you got? 13. And what place are you in? Uh, 18th. 18th now, yeah. Yeah, it is 18th, yeah. 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 So, what you've got, you're in a much tougher league, aren't you? Absolutely. Everybody yeah. says about how difficult it is to get out of the championship. Yeah. I don't agree, my team did it very, very quickly. <laughs> I'm a Portsmouth what supporter. Way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but as a Southampton supporter looking at me at the moment, I know who you are, Robert, look the other way. <laughs> uh, cha championship's a much tougher league, isn't it? So, how do you change your management style from something where this time last year you were killing it, mm. and, and the, the the team spirit must have been amazing? Mm. What have you had to consciously change about the way you manage your team in order to get the best out of them when the circumstances are more difficult? Well, 
I initially came in um, start of 2011. I had six months to have a look at the squad, and we were in a decent position just outside the playoffs, or just in it, in and around there. Won my first four games, and it was it was terrific. You know, everyone thought, "Oh, it's going to be great." But I, I could look at our squad and realise why we were in League One, and why, um, you know, the the way the, the squad was, we were going we were going nowhere, and it was a conscious decision that um, you know we had all the heady days of being in the Premier League, and and then a, just a real downward spiral for the club. And you know, I've been a player in three different spells. Of course, you know this is my club really. It's the one I'm linked with, and I came in, and it was, you know, we're going to have to change something. We're going to have to change the psyche of the squad. We're going to have to change the the whole place, the feeling of the the football club. So um, I changed 18 players, changed over, and, and realised I knew exactly what we needed to do, and that was to get out of League One. So we achieved that um, last year. It was a terrific year for everyone great feeling, albeit in League One. Mm. But we, as we touched on earlier, we were top <coughs> and we were sort of the team that was hunted. But we always felt, no matter who we played against, we'd win. You know, and uh, that that paid off. We only lost five games throughout the whole season, which, you know, is quite unheard of, really. It was a superb year for, for us and for me. But then going into this year, we knew, and I knew, that <coughs> it's going to be quite up and down for us because we had a squad built for League One. I knew I had a nucleus of players that would be okay in the Championship, but I knew, um, you know, moving on, we would have to spend quite a bit of money to improve us and try and move us forward. That's not always possible, um, and we're fighting against clubs in this league that have spent quite a bit of money. So it has changed. My outlook on my squad and you know our results have been up and down. Um, there's no hiding from that. Um, but that's going to happen this year. I mean, we we are now trying to move forward. You know, after having three years in League One, it's a step forward for us, a huge step. And of course, the ultimate for us would be to end up in the Premier League again. But that may take us, you know, a year, two years, three years. Um, but that's going to be our aim now, and of course, we're up against sides that um, we're all fine to get there. Twenty of the teams out of the twenty-four have been in the Premier League before, so mm. you know everyone's trying to get there. I mean, it's um, it's been a tough baptism for for the players and for me because we haven't got the points maybe we should have deserved. I think you know we drew the other night at Leeds, should have won. Uh, we've had a few things go against us. We didn't play well at all last Saturday uh, but that comes with the territory that's fine you know you bounce back and you want to respond in your, your next games but we're going to be okay you know I think we uh, I'm learning all the time I've only been a manager for 20 months you know which is quite a short time you know to manage people footballers to manage uh, supporters mm. you know, to manage up up top you know my own and directors it's um it's a real fine balance in that, but you know, I enjoy it in a perverse way. I do. <laughs> so the the se last season was your first full season as a manager. It was, yeah. How much at the end of the back end of the previous season did you manage the team? How many games roughly was it? Oh, I had I had um, <coughs> half the season. Oh, you had half the season yeah. with them. Okay. Yeah. You, you said you knew straight away that you know you could see why it was a League One team, what you needed to do to yeah. sort it out. But you said I think you changed eighteen players in that summer. Initially, yeah. That's yeah. a massive change, isn't yeah. it? So when you were doing that, how clear were you in your mind and your gut feel, I suppose, that what you were doing was absolutely right? Were you sort of, I'm 90% certain this is going to work, or were you 110%, I'll do this and it will work? I was 100% certain from about March. Really? Yeah, yeah. We couldn't carry on because, you know, I, I won't be disrespectful to the players that have <coughs> moved on, but they had no feeling for the place. They had no... It didn't matter if they won or lost. There was no real feeling. I knew with a new group, which would be my group, I could ingrain to them, listen, you know, you've got to have a bit of feeling about this place and care. You know, you come into a new club, you need to impress not only myself and my coaching staff, but more importantly, the people that sit around there. 
you know, and, and show them why I've brought you here. And um, I started off with 18 players, ended up signing 24, including the loan signings. It's a big overhaul. I mean, it, it, it very rarely happens, but it was conscious because we had a few players that were on good money at League One level coming to the end of their contracts. They knew they were not going to get offered that money again here. So they, they wanted to go elsewhere. So I quickly said, right, that's fine, that's your prerogative, but I'm going to be bringing in people so there'd be no offer for you to, to carry on. It was a big call because there were some good players. Samido, Jose Samido has gone to Sheffield Wednesday. Good player, but he, um, he wanted to see what was out there. And I said, look, I can't wait. I'm going to have to bring in players um, that are going to move this club forward. So, you know, that's tough because it's a big call because he was, he was our player of the year. Mm. You know, but it was his his choice, and mm. you know you're not always in a position to to keep everyone happy. And being a manager, you have to make these calls sometimes. You said you a bit unlucky at Leeds, uh, mm. got a draw, should have had a win. Yeah. Now in that circumstance, obviously it can go one or two ways. You, the players themselves can draw strength <coughs> from that and think, okay, fine, but it's there, the base is there, we can move on, we're a decent team. Or it can be that you get that creep into the team of, oh bloody, how things aren't going to go right for yeah. us. How do you keep the motivation going at a time when you're not getting the, the results that you feel you deserve and you've not got the points on the board that you want at the moment? Well, I think you keep telling them. You know, I've had the, the group this morning. We had a debrief on the game this morning. We got back at four in the morning on uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. So we gave them yesterday off and we had a debrief today. And I showed them all the stuff they were doing so well and obviously we, we came against a, a keeper that was on top form on the night. Now, if you keep showing them that they're actually doing the right things, you're not doing anything wrong with regards to uh, that particular game. Of course, every game is different, um, but keep giving them that belief that you know they can compete in this league because that's another thing. You know we've come into a league where quite a few of them never played before, so. You know, mentally they'll be thinking, can I do it? They'll be asking questions of themselves because we all do that when we move up um, in business, whatever. That you kind of think, you know, will I be able to handle this? And uh, they've they've been good, and you know, and you you show them that uh, the games we've won, that you can do it. And you draw strength from that. We draw strength from uh, the game the other night because we have another big test on Saturday going to Wolves, very similar to what we done Tuesday, very similar club with stature and size of support. So they've been through that scenario, been through that experience. So it shouldn't really phase them next time. Mm. Are you happy to stand up in front of the players if you feel that you've um, called the tactics wrong in a game and that it's down to you? Are you the sort of manager that would say to them, look, I've, I've got this one wrong, we need to do this, we need to do this, or are you going to blame them? No, I always get it right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you know, I always... Tactics are important to a point. It's ultimately about players. You know, Jem, you know, she fights and she'll have tactics about her opponent. But when she's out there, something may just happen so quickly that you quickly change. Mm -hmm. And that happens in, in football. You know, you, you can go out there and you've worked on things all week and the player doesn't do it and you think it's down to him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's down to you now. I, I've always felt that. The week leading up to the game is great. You know, we we have uh, we look at the opposition, we look at us, we look at everything. Once the whistle goes and, and they're out there, I can't do a thing. Really, I can ask them to change formation. Yeah. I can bring a sub on. But ultimately, if they don't want to run and make that tackle, yeah, sure. or they don't want to run and get on the end of that cross. Yeah. You know, and sometimes, when well, not sometimes, the manager ultimately pays for it. You know, and that that's the business I'm in, but. I'm in it with my eyes wide open. I know exactly uh, what happens in this game. Do you find that hard, given that you were playing only two years ago? <laughs> Not really. No? Uh, no, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to um, be, um, have a coaching role at, at Leicester and I had a real education on the outside. So I'm, I saw Nigel Pearson working with his team and staff. And I was sort of weaning myself off playing because that's always the, the hard thing when you actually say to yourself I'm going to stop playing mm. um, but no I mean it's uh, it's what football's about you know you've got a manager of a football club but you've got 20,000 other managers yeah 
you know, you know ask those fans. No, like that. <laughs> right. But you've got twenty thousand other managers yeah. who will all do things differently. Yeah. But you've got to have belief in yourself and uh, say to yourself, you know, I'm born to do this. I'm I'm ready for this, and you know, have conviction in your decisions. You've got to. If you don't, you shouldn't do it. And for somebody who's not been managing for very long, you've got an awful lot of positive press, which is bloody difficult in, in England, isn't it? Um, there's been talk of you on many occasions being a future England manager. Oh, now, <laughs> what, after judo? Of, of <laughs> I was going to say, how different do you think it would be managing a national team compared to managing a team that you work with in week in, week out? It's a job for a, an older manager. Without a doubt, so I think Roy Hodgson, regardless, or, or Harry Redknapp, I know he was people's favourite, they, they would be the right age. Mm. Because I think when you're a younger manager, you want to be out there, you still have a real feeling for playing, you know, I still join in with the players, not all the time, because after five minutes I'm knackered. <laughs> but, um, I think you still need to have that day-to-day -day, uh, working with players, with a football club. It is a job for an older manager, no doubt. I mean, you know, I'm talking about having 20,000 sort of people having their opinions here. England manager, you've got the whole country. Yeah. You've yeah. got the whole country, and you could ask everyone here and we'd all have a different England team. Yeah. Every single one of us, and it's, no matter what Roy does, you know, they beat San Marino 5-0, some people aren't happy, it should have been 6, should have been 7, should have been... Scored the first one quick enough. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it, it's, I mean, yeah, uh, that's a tough role, you know, but he's a good man. <coughs> Um, you know, and it, it's no matter who's in charge of England, so they're always going to have a tough time. And I've got to tell you now, I, you never say never, but actually, yeah, never. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I, I wouldn't like to do that job. You know, but I might be, I might think differently when I'm sort of 60 and not involved in club football. Yeah, you know, is. because you look at most managers, Trapattoni. We're talking to. Chap on my table, Chap with Tony's uh, in his 70s, I think. 73. 73. I mean, that's, that's, that's old to be involved in football, but it's right because you're not doing it day to day. Yeah, you've got the experience. You got your first thing in the cap at 31, didn't you? Yeah. Did you think you'd missed it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So when that first game, was it against Spain? It was indeed, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to get this across, but like, all of us who, who, you know, maybe as kids dreamed that we would do it one day. What does it actually feel like to be stood wearing the England shirt in a national anthem go? I don't think anything will beat that in my footballing career. Now I'm managing. Um, I think it's only surpassed by, um, you know, becoming a father, I think, because it's just the biggest moment ever. You know, it really was because just like you, what you said, you know, I had the old Admiral England kit, Kevin Keegan and all that, and, <coughs> you know, you, you, you want to become a professional, which, you know, was, I still think is one of the highlights when I was told I was <coughs> being a professional footballer. Mm. But when I got the call up, um, I remember seeing Gareth Southgate in the hotel up in Birmingham, and he said, he wasn't in the squad and we were friends from 16 and Crystal Palace. And he said, have you looked in the mirror yet with your training kit? <laughs> so it's funny you should say that. <laughs> and it's true. He said, the first time you get in, because you have a, a room on your own, you don't share like you do at club football. <clears throat> your kit's brought to your door and they knock on your door, but you, you open the door and no one's there, but your kit's there. <laughs> I brought the kit in and I put it on my bed and obviously I, my phone was going mad. And then I had a quiet moment and I just looked at my shirt I looked in the mirror. <laughs> no, I did, you know, and it's like, it's not a replica, it's not something from yeah. Sports Direct or, <laughs> you know. And I just remember uh, when I worked out, I was in the team from when we were training. And I saw Beckham had a bib and skulls and Michael Owen, and then uh, Steve McLaren was a coach with, with Todd, and so he gave me a bib, and I thought, Bloody hell, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought, I've worked it out, you know, and um, uh, I got told I was in, and then you know, all the family came up. But I was in the tunnel, and we all had mascots, and I 
stood there in the shirt, and I thought, this is the real shirt. This is it. You know, I have a name on the back, and you know, there's no turning back now. <laughs> you know, um, and I walked out in the national anthem and sung that, and I just thought it, it's almost surreal. Yeah. You know, I've got to say, looking back now, it's almost like it. It was like in a dream, you know. But yeah. I know it happened, you know, and it's a great moment, you know, a great moment for me and, and for this club. You know, we haven't had a England international for over 30 years, you know, and I was the chosen one. It's a great moment. Just for the sake of clarity, you said it was the greatest moment apart from the birth of your children. Do you want to just look down there? We're editing later, and to say, and obviously my wedding day. <laughs> 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 just in case, all right? We'll edit it in. No one will know. She'll be all right. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Uh, you we had a child. good day. We had a good day. <laughs> right. A couple of frivolous things to finish with. Now, there's not many footballers that are renowned for their intellect, are there? <laughs> What's the stupidest thing you've ever heard a footballer say? Oh, God. <laughs> um, I'm trying to be clean. <laughs> um, I'm going to find this quite hard to answer, actually. Um, what, because of the scale of choice? or <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of that. Um, <coughs> Have you got one in mind? <laughs> well, next question, please. <laughs> Not a your to answer. Oh. I mean, in the context, it may not sound funny. Um, but we had a player here who uh, used to just come up with some very strange comments and used to just ask about, you know. <laughs> I said, do you think, he was trying to, he was getting his first property, so it was his first mortgage, which is a big, big moment for, for everyone. And uh, he started saying, do you think Michael Jackson has got a mortgage? Do you, do you, <laughs> <laughs> who do you think it's with? <laughs> Sounds odd. We were sitting in the dressing room. <laughs> I would never ever tell you who that was. Uh, he said a few others, but I, I just remember that with clarity because I was thinking, why is he mentioned him? And, you know, what, what are we going to say? Abbey National? Halifax? <laughs> but uh, no, there's loads more, but uh, move on. Please. Just for context, was it before or after Michael Jackson died? <laughs> Before. Okay, that's not quite so bad then. Okay. Um, there's a lot of crap comes off the terraces. I don't know if you're allowed to call it terraces anymore, are you? From the 20,000 of your loyal fan base. What's the wittiest thing you've ever heard a fan say? Um, well, you are testing me today. I mean, some fans can come up with some absolute classics, to be fair. Um, Chris... Chris Bart Williams, who played here, uh, we were playing at Spurs, and uh, we won a corner. And he was running over uh, to take the corner, and he said a Spurs fan shouted out and said, uh, "You're not dead yet, Bart Williams." <laughs> and he, he stood there and he looked at the fella and he said, "Because you're about 81." <laughs> and he said he was just chuckling all the way. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously we, we get a bit of abuse at times, <laughs> players and managers, but um, there is a lot of humour out there, you know, with supporters. I had, I had quite a lengthy chat with a few Leeds fans during the games the other day, and they were fine, you know, they were fine, and obviously uh, they've had a bit of bad press recently, but, um, you know, football is a, a game that actually the majority of fans are, are quite knowledgeable and, you know, know their football, know their team, and... Um, Realise that there's two teams there that, you know, that are there to do their best. You know, so um, I've heard lots of great stuff, and, and football's a, a, a game for all, really. So, and the last one of the silly ones. What's the stupidest question you've ever had aimed at you in a press conference? Who's my press guys? <laughs> <laughs> We've just gone. Uh, I mean, I I've done my press conference today, and it's not. So much the stupidest question is, uh, 
they come thick and fast. Sometimes they're, they're told what to say. But sometimes they come under the pretense of um, talking to you about your team or the, uh, the previous game, excuse me, or the next game. But they, once they're in there, they, they just have, they have a different agenda sometimes, which is a real shame because you rather they say they're coming here to talk to you about uh, Wolves on Saturday or Leeds last week. But they, you know, I've got questions today about Ferdinand and um, you know the racism issues and all those things like that, which I'm quite open to. <laughs> to take. But you know, I'd rather that they uh, they're up front, you know, because um, you, you you'd like to know what, exactly what you're dealing with because they're looking for you to slip up. That's what it is. Okay. Um, last one. You said um, who uh, who you felt that uh, perhaps didn't motivate you in the past. Who's who has been the best person to motivate you through your career? Um. I mean, I've, I've had a few managers, to be honest with you. Um, when I, I left Crystal Palace at 19-20, I went to play for Southend and David Webb, who used to play for Chelsea many moons ago. He was a real hard taskmaster, but really good for me at that time um, because it was the start of my career, really. Um, I only played a few games for Palace. Um, had a number of managers then. At South End, Barry Fry and Peter Taylor and uh, a lot of different guys. But then I left South End, went to Derby County and had Jim Smith. And he was terrific. Very kind of old school in his methods. He had a modern manager, which some of you may laugh at, but uh, Steve McLaren was the coach who hasn't done too well, as we know, managed superb in Holland. Um, and they played a good cop, bad cop role, really. and. Again, terrific for me. But then I came here and I was under Anna Kerbishley, who um, you know, had done so well for um, for the club um, in what a 15-year period. <coughs> and he was he was superb how he managed us and how he let us play. And um, you know I've taken a few of the things that he done that I use now. You know so. Um, he was important to me. Nigel Pearson, right at the end of my career, because of ending my playing career and going into uh, coaching and managing, it was important for me, looking back now, that I had the right person who would give me uh, a real insight and education. Because it can be hard if you don't know how to handle certain situations. Um, as a young manager, you can be uh, you can be left to to, to really suffer. So. Um, They've, they've been, you know, those guys who I've mentioned have been really important for me in my career and also in my managing career now. Excellent. Thanks very much for this afternoon. Very much appreciate, you. appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule. Today. Yeah. Very much appreciate no that. No problem. Um, thanks very much again. And just best of luck to both of you and what you do. Good luck for Saturday. And that's yeah. your injury gets itself sorted out and uh, you're back on the mat soon. And that's a correct expression. That's not a stalker thing, OK? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks ever so much, both of you. Thanks very much. Actually, very much. yeah, go on. No, just what you said, a judo player. I've never heard. Yeah. Does anyone else no, think? No, no. I've never heard that. What would you call it? No, I just... Is it judoka is the Japanese. Right. OK. Does that? real phrase for it but judoka some people might not know what that is yeah, so you say judo player or you can use judo fighter if you want but judo player yeah <laughs> oh yeah Jim. <laughs> 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 it's kind of old news though <laughs> 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 it is old news <laughs> <laughs> yeah I can't wear it right my leg. Have you got to give that back at the end of the season? Um, no. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when you got to give I think they back? give us. <laughs> now hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I think they give us a copy. A well, this record. might be ours. I think this one. We had one where it had Brighton's name on it. They won it the year before. I can't really see it. So this might be our one. Yeah. Yeah, we do get one. Thanks, man. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much. Much appreciated.
thank you very much for coming today. Paul, is there anything you'd like to say to close off today? Just really again, um, yes, Red State said, I really appreciate you making the journey today. I know some people are coming from a long way overseas and uh, across the country. So thanks for joining us. And it was a special day for us and a special year for Charlton and also Team GB. Um, you know, we want to celebrate today. Thank you. And uh, hopefully, I'll bump into you before you leave. Thank you very much. Cheers, okay. guys. Cheers.